student record. Okay. All right. So I uh, want to welcome everyone to Environmental Fridays. It is personal. This is season five of Environmental Fridays. And if you wish to see um, our lineup of speakers and their bios for actually for the entire academic year, you could use that link down below on this, as well as you can use the QR code. By the way, is everybody seeing my um, slide? No, I, do I need to stop share? Oh, um, it's not necessary, I don't okay. think. Okay. But are you, seeing, are you seeing my PowerPoint, my slide? No, we're not seeing yours. Oh. oh, you're not? Okay. So hold on one minute. Uh, let's see what's going on here. We need to... It shows you as sharing in the participants, but it's not... Sure. Yeah. So probably um Dr. Belford it could yeah okay. yeah stop sharing and see yeah. let's see if that works. There we go. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing it now? Yeah. Okay. All right. So let me get back to this. So yeah, I was saying that. All right, seeing it, right? Yes. Okay, so I was saying that if uh, anyone wants to see the entire lineup for our academic school year, both this semester, fall um, through December, and next semester through, I believe, April, you can use the link below here and or use the QR code to get to that. So for the first two episodes, I wanted us to kind of reflect on this particular photo because this photo is iconic. It's one of the most remarkable photos taken. It was taken by an Apollo astronaut. Um, it's termed Earth Rise. And again, if you want to learn more, the, that particular astronaut was um, interviewed and if you um, use the QR code, you could get to the interview there. We're not gonna play that, but what does this picture, uh, how does this picture make you feel? How does this picture make you feel to see earth? And the brown, you know, the gray surface in front is, is the surface of the moon. How does this make, picture make you feel? Anybody could answer, student, professor, co-host, anyone could answer. This picture actually was um, or, or influenced the environmental movement. It was the photo, it was one of the things that triggered the observance of Earth Day. And so it is uh, iconic in the sense that it shows us home. This is our home, our planet, our blue planet. And um, it should, I think, give us a sense of awe and wonder and also um, inspire us to try to keep it clean, safe, conserve it. And so that's one of the things that hopefully I think um, we can take away from this this photo, All right? So yeah, I see some comments um, responding to your question. Someone said, "Tiny feels oh. bright and empowering," and home came to mind for me as well. I was like, "That's home." <laughs> That's home. That is home. Yes, very nice. So okay, so the students were um, responding in the chat. Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. All right, so we'll move on. 
So today my co-host mm -hmm. is a longtime friend. I actually um, was reminiscing with her that I went to elementary school, I believe, with her two uncles, Willis and Aaron Wilson. <laughs> and I've known her and her sister, um, particularly when they came to school here at Andrews. You came to school at Andrews? Yes, yes. In, that was, was it the 80s? Late Not 90s, early 2000s. Yes, yes. So we've known each other for, for a bit. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> so uh, Delamay Wilson is uh, currently the chair of the Natural and Life Sciences at the College of Science, Technology and Applied Arts of Trinidad and Tobago, um, generally called COSTAT. Um, she's also currently enrolled, and I think that's what you were making reference to earlier about getting yeah. credit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she's also currently enrolled in the doct doctoral program for um, education. Um, higher Education Leadership at the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine, Trinidad. So, um, Delmay, Miss Wilson, soon to be hopefully Dr. Wilson. <laughs> um, it's your turn to introduce our speaker today. Sure. Um, thank you. So I get the honor of introducing or or speaker for today, Professor or Dr. Stanton, Stanton G. Belford, who's currently the program coordinator for biology at the University of Tennessee Southern, UTS, which you also referencing before. And he was born, and this is where I start to, I won't say embellish a little bit, but he was born in the beautiful, warm, vibrant, diversity-rich island of Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit biased because I'm from there as well. Um, he received his scholarship to attend Martin Methodist College, where he got his BSc degree in biology, then went on to Middle Tennessee State University and connected with, I believe it's Dr. Don Phillip at the University of the West Indies that got him, mentored him and got him involved with the reef surveys and the molecular analysis of marine organisms at TOCO, which I believe we'll hear some of your studies about yeah. today. All right, so take it away, Dr. Okay. Stanford. I'll stop mm -hmm. sharing. Oh, first, okay. Yeah. Uh, you, can, you can go ahead and um, share. Okay. All right, can you all see my screen? Uh, yes, we okay. can. All right. All right, so um, I'm just going to say this. So for my students joining in, joining in uh, please in the chat, uh, put your name uh, so that you can get your extra extra. Uh, it, will, <laughs> it will be recorded. Um, five points for you, yay. All right, so my whole, I guess, I guess I should tell you the story um, and my entire story of how I became um, interested on in, in the ocean and on coral reefs um, in Trinidad and Tobago as well is because of curiosity. Um, I am, um, and this photo here is actually at Saline Bay or also called Celibia Bay, uh, Toku, Trinidad. And when you see me on the reefs, I'm always looking down. <laughs> I'm always looking in the water. And I can tell you, I have been doing research um, on these reefs for over 15 years, um, approaching 20 years. And every time I go, I try to travel three to four times a year. And every single time I go, I always see something different. Um, I take my high school friends with me. And what I've seen is that because they have a different eye, they may not recognize certain things because 
I recognize, um, you know, channel into certain species I see on a reef. So when they see nine different ones and they ask me, hey, what is this? I will, I know them, I'll tell them what it is. But sometimes on the 10th one, they usually find something different. And so for example, here at Saline Bay, um, one of my high school buddies, he saw something, he's like, hey, this looks different to what we see all the time. And it was a knobby brain coral, which I have never seen that um, here. Um, I do see it at my other site, um, which is close to the fishing depot, which I'll talk about. But staying curious in science, um, that's really where, that's the foundation um, of my story, really. So um, what I have pretty much um, done or where most of my story uh, story begins is at pretty much my so your top right. Um, this is Grand Elancy or Toku Bay. And so this is where my high school teacher, uh, Dr. Car Carol Draper, uh, she brought us out to the reefs. And for five days during carnival, so five days we couldn't go to carnival. Um, we would go and do surveys on these reefs. And so uh, today, and this was in the 90s, so I'm not going to give away my age because I tell students that I have, um, you know, I, you know, by the way, I do uh, push ups for every A a student make on exams. So I kind of embellish that a little bit. All right, uh, five push-ups for every A. I think they get a big kick out of it. Uh, at least the classes that make five or six A's on a regular. You All do right, the push-ups in the class? In the class, yep. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, I need a workout, too. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or I need some motivation, as I can say. But um, <laughs> believe it or not, this is the C, and that was in the 90s. Um, she introduced us to the to the coral reefs as high school students. And to this day, I still do research um, on these reefs. Um, a reintroduction of, of these reefs came when I did my master's at Middle Tennessee State University. So that will be um, in your 2000s. So 2005 to 2007. And I contacted um, Dr. Dawn Phillip, a uh, former lecturer, lecturer at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. And so she took this photo here um, with me, um, really. So during low tides, um, as a, and I'll talk a little bit about the methods used um, during uh, line transect and quadrat methods used to collect um, uh, bent thick coverage. All right, so she took this photo, as you can see here is 2006. Um, and so this, towards the end of that master's, um, my chair wanted me to do some genetics. So I was fortunate to um, start uh, genetic work. And this is me here at the, at UE St. Augustine, um, the professor there, Dr. Ram Subaj. He allowed me to use his lab there. Uh, I do most of the genetic research here at University of Tennessee Southern. And I'm fortunate to also train students here as well to do that. Um, so both my high school, um, Dr. Carl Draper, um, and then UE lecturer, Dr. Dawn Phillip. Um, Dr. Dawn Phillip and I pretty much did a lot of the research on surveying here. Um, unfortunately, she passed some years ago, also Dr. Draper. But we've always talked about doing annual surveys on the reefs, um, really for, for the rest of our lives. Yeah. So kind of in honor of her, um, I continue to do research on these reefs, well, for I guess as long as I get on planet Earth. Um, yeah. in, 
in her honor. Um, believe it or not, Desmond, uh, my dad, who lived Blanche Shares, a small coastal village north of Trinidad, he would take me, put me on his back and shoulders, and we would ride the waves. Wow. And so one day, he cupped some water from the ocean, mm -hmm. and he gave me a drink. <laughs> and I spit it out, and it was so salty, and I was wondering why he did this. But guess what? He told me, now you would never forget the ocean. That's right. And so I am, you know, I am stuck with never forgetting the ocean and i can see that image of him doing that like it was yesterday mm -hmm. i lost him um, at an early age so i am honoring these very important people mentors in my life by carrying on the work mm -hmm. and uh, also training students um, along the way to do that Yes. Um, so until just so you'll know, until 2019, I took my last group of students from the college there. Um, I, I'm taking a few next year. So they just gave me permission to start back taking students um, okay. mm -hmm. since we're post pandemic ish. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so um, they just kind of gave me permission to do that. Good. So what's so curious about um, these reefs here is that they, so at Granny Lancy, so next to the Toko Fishing Depot, it's an area of upwelling. So coal water comes up uh, from deeper and actually provides a lot of nourish, nourishing here um, for reef creatures. So you see different, you see a higher species richness of corals here. Um, and this, I don't know, uh, Desmond and Delmi, if you all know this, this is actually the site of the projected uh, Toko port, mm. um, which will cause a total 100% destruction yeah. of these uh, patch reefs here. Of course, that project was halted by the pandemic um who knows what will happen i guess it all depends on um government but we'll see we'll see i, I steady collect data um both surveys and genetic um steadily publishing bit by bit um so that they have the knowledge of do what's you going consult on. with them do they ask for your this so in the a group um, so this is my activism part of the whole yes, um, yes. thing. Um, we submit uh, reports to the EMA. Um, right, if right. you're doing this type of work, you have to submit okay. to the EMA, and then they make it available to the public and respond to it. So we have done that, I guess, for a second time again um, on it. So um we will be waiting on results of that and when i say activism i'm talking about groups from uh, individuals uh, even uh, groups of species which is in tobago they do a right. lot in tobago. they also submit um, responses um, okay. so that's all all part of it all right okay this has allowed me so staying curious, I took a class on scuba diving in, at, while at Middle Tennessee State University uh, while I was doing the master's. I took this course, scuba diving, to actually de-stress, not have any stress. Because if you learn to scuba dive, you're underwater, you're just thinking about being alive. You don't think about bills. You don't think about you know research. You don't think about classes, and this gave me the opportunity. Uh, so when I went to do my PhD at Auburn University in Alabama, um, to join a group to scuba dive and do research on clownfish and sea anemones in the Red Sea. So I actually have sixty-six scuba dives in the Red Sea um, doing, and a publication and uh, doing research on clownfish and 
Nazi enemies. So I'd say to all those who are looking at this presentation, if there's a scuba diving class at your college, university, take it <laughs> because my former advisor here, she was looking for students to do research um, in, in the Caribbean. And it was so St. John, US Virgin Islands, um, looking at the symbiosis between uh, clean a shrimp and sea anemones there. And she was also looking for a student to do research on symbiosis on clownfish and their sea anemones. So guess what? I'm from the Caribbean. Let me do the Red Sea. <laughs> and that's how I got to do this. Um, one of the best, I think, periods I can say in my life, scuba diving in the Red Sea. Mm. Right? So that's initially where I am with the ocean on learning because you have to learn depending on what you want. If you want to do shallow water, if you want to scuba dive, do a little bit more deeper, um, there's even deep sea um, research. So we have uh, Dr. Diva Amon. She is um, connected. She's a Trinbegonian um, and she is a world-class scientist. Uh, Dr. Judy Gobin from UWI, she's also, they all do some amazing work on that. And, you know, they're always interested in students. Like, you know, so believe it or not, in the Caribbean, we have history of, you know, really, really uh, cool scientists, marine scientists. Um, so, you know, the trend continues. Uh, for this, and um, I hope to train more students um, in this aspect. Mm -hmm. So, what about high school? What about college? Um, really, it's a continuation. How do we get students from high school, even in college, how do we get them interested and curious in science? And that's why we do all the labs. You know, we do, if you take a course, there's a lab. If you take a science course, there is a lab with it, right? So, you know, you want to make sure that the lab activity kind of improves the curiosity of the student. And so why is that important? What are the issues right now in the environment? There is global climate change, the you know, core bleaching, there is, um, you name it, there are ex extreme flooding, there is, there is, I mean, extreme drought and fires, you name it. All these have a lot to do with the environment. So if we can attach lab environment, sorry, lab activities and related to environmental issues, then guess what? Now, students, whether in their high school or collegiate, now they may be curious on how, what should we do now? Hey, one planet Earth, you know, so how how can they assist as well? Um, and a lot of that has to do with discussing uh, some, you know, controversial issues with the environment. Oh, we're seeing a lot of that, a lot of that, from deep sea mining to I mean, you name it, we have a lot of environmental issues where we need citizens and students to um, make important contributions. I always say, step out of the box. I don't like snakes, but guess what? <laughs> Try something different. Um, discover, you know, discover something different about yourself. I tried scuba diving and guess what? That allowed me to have the opportunity to go to Key Largo, Florida and scuba dive and see reefs there, to go to the Red Sea and see reefs there. So, you know, step out of your comfort zone. Um, as you can see, I'm doing here. Um, right, so the role of the science teacher is once again, you know, how can we ignite the curiosity of the student? How can we let them love science a little bit more? And that includes non-majors, all right? What I do, 
So let me give you a really, really good um, example of curiosity. I do mostly surveys on the reefs, figuring out percentage coverage of different species. Um, I do a lot of that. But later on, bio biotechnology, so molecular tools have really, really exploded in um, scientific interests. So this now has really, really allowed me to go into phase two of my science life. And it some of the things that molecular tools offer, um, whereas 20 years ago, you had to be in a huge lab, but now I, all these things come in small kits where you can use right here. Um, you can have publishable data on it right here. Um, so that's, that's where now I train my students. Um, most of the labs here, upper level biology labs, we use these DNA tissue extraction kits. You know, what species is this? How can we identify this particular species? So we use molecular tools. How are they related to other species? And that's where we use phylogeny from using these uh, tools. So we jump in the lab. And so why I've become so interested in molecular techniques is because of this here. Well, okay, so boulder star coral, fire coral, um, some soft zoanthirian coral. Wait a minute, in this? So looking at symbionts inside them, wait a minute, in this sea anemone, potential new species of symbiont? And so, you know, that's exciting. You know, wait, right here in Toko, you hmm. have something that may be new. And so that's just something, and you connect a lot of this information. So once again, email a professor at uh, Penn State University, uh, Dr. Todd Lajanis, who his, his, his advisor um, was the top person in the world on coral symbionts. Very nice guy. So top scientists in the world. They will in they invite he invited me into the lab and I did this there and you know it was is really really um, interesting uh, part of uh, science for me so that's kind of what where I actually started now the genetic aspect so um, Trinidad and Tobago so I mostly do collect samples and do. Um, surveys to Libya Bay, also called Saline Bay. Um, I collect samples all the way northeastern coast and then Grand Elanza or Toku Bay. So to my fellow Trinis on the on the Zoom here, this is basically where you have the Toku fishing depot um, and also the potential site for the port. Hmm. All right. All right, so a lot of what I do now is so I take photos um, using an underwater um, camera housed in an underwater apparatus, and then I take specimens, so tiny tentacles, and so we do genetic analyses on those, um, and then we identify the species. Some are easily identifiable, uh, some are not. So, which means now I have to improve my survey techniques because um, benthic coverage, I, you know, you need more information on specific species. So, during dry tide, which is very lowest low tide. So, by the way, um, I plan all my trips to Trinidad on low tides. I cannot purchase a ticket unless I have really nice low tides. So um, in the distance, I don't know if you all can tell. So this is where the Toko Lighthouse is. Yeah. You can just barely see that in the distance. But essentially, so fucked up. you, I run a, a line transit. This is a 50 meter reel. Um, and at every 
under every 50 centimeter, um, I take what the benthic uh, component is. And I run that all the way to the end um, and do it, do replicates as well. So I get a mean or average on pretty much what's there. So hard corals, mean percentage uh, cover on my y-axis, and then what's there. Uh, zoanthereans, these are small anemone-like uh, cnidarians, and I'll talk about that. Um, algae, uh, other, so you have sea urchins, you have sea cucumbers, um, those go in that category. But if I break it down, this is what I'm interested in. So parietes, those are finger corals, they look like fingers, and then these two zoanthereans. So when I look at saline bay, we call this Celebia bay, uh, um, granulancy or toku bay, and pikil bay. Um, what you notice is that you have, in some cases, uh, kind of more evenly distributed between both of these zoanthereans, but then palitho, which looks like a brown mat. If you look at my background, it's pretty much entire palitho, uh, which if you're not careful, you can slip and slide, um, but you can walk on them. Uh, you don't, you don't want to walk on the hard corals uh, because they take long. You definitely don't want to walk on the hydrozoan uh, fire coral because it will let you know it's fire coral with its uh, intense sting. All right, so what are these? Mm. What do they look like? Um, car I call it carnival in the ocean. Um, <laughs> various colors, uh, various shapes. Um, it is easy to think, well, all of these are different species. All right. Um, there are thousands of zoanthirian species globally in the oceans. But what we see here at northeastern coast of Toku is uh, different ones. So all my surveys... Um, I count these as either two species, but through genetic analysis, I am now able to determine what they are. So how do I do this? Um, I take small samples, so one polyp. So for example, here, you might say, well, okay, here's one species, here's another species. Um, you're correct, here's a finger coral. Um, there seems to be another one here. Uh, what are they? Hey, wait a minute. This seems to be something different here. So morphologically, it seems like, okay, they're different. But we need small samples, extract the DNA. So that's where we use an extraction kit. Then we do the thermocycler. Um, or PCR, and we run a gel electrophoresis. Um, and this is really cool because students see this, so the, the DNA here, and we just send them to sequence. So what are the sequences of these? So for example, what is this species here? We're not sure because it's a different color from everything else. So we use the molecular technique right here in the lab, um, not that expensive to determine this. And so that really has excited me because what is DNA sequencing? Well, it's a bunch of adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, or the nitrogenous bases, all in its particular sequence. Now we look for a gene within that DNA and we compare it to others um, on online um, at NCBI. And so we just can compare them. And what we're able to do is now take, for example, Zoanthus 44 specimen. It's bright green. It's from Western Celebia B. And now all those match the particular species, Zoanthus pulchellus. We do the same thing, uh, Z58, Zoanthid 58, BLU Blue from Western Celebia Bay, and it matches an already online um, 
100% or close to 100% in this case uh, through 1000 replicates and 95% matching. And now we know, wow, these are separate species here. What does that tell us? Wow, this looks like something different. This looks like something different. This looks like something different. But through these genetic analysis, these molecular tools, now we know this is species Zoanthus societus, Zoanthus pulchellus, Zoanthus societus. How does that look with their Pacific counterparts? So Zoanthus societus in the Atlantic, its cousin is Zoanthus sansibaricus in the Indo-Pacific. Right here at Toku, Zoanthus pulchellus, its cousin all the way across in the Pacific, Zoanthus vietnamensis. And presenting here for the first time, um, manuscript accepted in the uh, uh, journal uh, Trinidad and Tobago, Tobago's Naturalist uh, Club Journal, um, awaiting online uh, through Dr. Amy Deacon at University of West Indies. Zoanthus affinity pulchellus, or closely related to its um, cousin all the way over, uh, Zoanthus curioso. Now, I can tell you that the difference between Zoanthus societus and Zoanthus pulchellus is seven base pairs mm. in its sequence. And the difference between pulchellus and a closely related species is three base pairs. But now look at this. Now, when I go into reefs to do surveys, <clears throat> I know what these look like. So now I can separate all my zoanthariums into one, two, three species. Mm -hmm. So now I actually, in the future, can have a better idea how these are distributed or at sites along uh, Toku and compare them to Palithoa as well. And that's something really, really interesting. Like, how are they? Like, what percent can we find them? Uh, how are they distributed? Are they close to the shore or further off close to the reef crest? What can we do? What can we see? That's the that's where the curiosity uh, comes in play. Um, so zoanthariums, if so I'm gonna play the short video. So what I want you to notice is you have Zoanthus pulchellus or societus or affinity pulchellus on the top. All right, I know it is it's during low tide. And then Palithoa, another zoantharia, on the bottom part. Why? Why are they distributed like this? Why? during lowest low tides, are they able to withstand being out of the water for three, three and a half hours? Mm. What is the biodiversity of their symbionts? All right, so while I'm doing research, I'm getting some other questions as well. So I am literally staying curious throughout research. Um, the next phase is what type of symbionts are found in these to where both these two or three or four species are able to survive in less than ideal conditions. And that's where student research, undergraduate student research comes in. That's, I think this is the best part of um, what I do is training students. Um, and here's the thing. Um, these are like my first two students that I took to Trinidad. And here we're actually looking at sea urchin abundance, um, and which was something Dr. Dawn Philip wanted us to do. Um, mm -hmm. We could never get at it, but now with students doing the research, they can get at it. And that's, to me, that's what it's all about. Students. Um, Chloe, 
she is now at a master's program and Samantha, she's now at a master's program. They did research on these same zoanthariums and most of it, they did it in the lab. Unfortunately, they couldn't get to go to Trinidad because it was during the pandemic. But mm -hmm. samples collected tiny polyps and with the training in genetics, it really allowed them to, um, I guess, add another lang on their resume. And because of that, they were able to go through interviews. And now they have mentors. Now they have mentors for their master's research. Um, so this will be the proud moment um, in uh, my life here to successfully train these students and now they're in master's programs but we've only had three for this last academic year i want four <laughs> so next year so i have one um, some other colleagues have others we're hoping and this is a big part of the biology program's future is how do we get students now to eventually go to on to masters and PhD programs, and that's that's my task as program coordinator um, is training these students. My um, highlight of my I guess science career is presenting what um, I found using these molecular tools on these zoanthariums at Toku at the International Coral Reef Symposium. Um, in Bremen, Germany last year. Mm. So that was, it's like the World Cup of Coral Reef, um, you know, That's cool. conferences. So I was very fortunate to do that, um, represent, representing uh, the University of Tennessee Southern. All right. And so I encourage all my students to attend um, conferences and we take them to the local ones. Other things I do, I'm really, really glad that there is uh, BIMS, because they too um, have a lot of opportunities. And so this all also, uh, I do presentations, um, talks, I do sciences, but because of the opportunities provided here, any student, undergrad, high school, collegiate, uh, master's student, uh, PhD, um, can do um, very different things here because of the opportunities created uh, by BIMS. So I'm, I'm really enjoying um, knowing this community because it also helps me to spread um, the science. Mm. Because we, at the end of the day, guess what? We have to share the science. Uh, future endeavors, right now I have um, a couple of guests, uh, researchers here. We are trying to collaborate to write an NSF grant to submit next year, which a big part of that grant is to bring in students to work in labs doing research as well. And this is um, collaborators are from UCLA and University of Oregon. Um, and we're trying to put together a grant that involves a lot of students uh, coming to work alongside scientists at their perspective um, institutions. How cool would it be as an undergraduate student to go work in a lab with another scientist at UCLA for okay. six weeks and all expenses paid, um, they're just soaking in that knowledge. Um, and that's, I think that's what it's all about really, um, just passing on that to the next generation. So that's kind of my story. I'll stop there. Um, okay. One cool part about it is during the pandemic, um, I attended a cool online workshop, a BIMS workshop, and the one of the things were kind of showing you how to do a website. So I got my website. A um, lot of things um, on marine biology, a lot of research on there as well. Um, if you want to catch up on publications and even newspaper articles <laughs> about Trinidad. Um, so I'll stop right there because I'm curious about questions anyone would have, but stay curious in science because the opportunities will come. That's right. That's right. Thank you so very much. Del oh, my pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yes, Delame, you want to get us started in this? Portion? Sure. Yes. 
Well, first of all, um, uh, just um, I want to recognize all of the work that you've been doing for the environment here in the country. I appreciate that. While you were talking, I did a quick um, search online, Google, and saw some of the articles where you were writing it to um, government representatives regarding that. And I think um, what you demonstrated there is excellent, showing that connection between science and data and making changes to policy and procedures in the community. And that's what it's all about. Um, so that that was great to um, see that there. Um, you had mentioned climate change and um, how that impacts a lot of things. And well, we've been seeing a lot of changes with our weather patterns, the flooding you had mentioned. And um, sometimes we have periods where there's no rain and there should be. Um, I noted from your pictures and from what you said that you come in low tide. Have you noticed any changes to the geographical coastline in the areas that you frequent over the years? That yes. Makes, yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, almost 20 years, um, definitely you see a lot of uh, erosion at um, next to the Toho port. Um, mm -hmm. There are there are properties there. Um, I spoke to one of the owners, she has properties there, you know, house there, and they have to kind of back things up because mm -hmm. the erosion alone is, the intense erosion alone, coastline erosion, um, is taking back the land. Um, yeah, okay. In, yeah. So in that area, it's taking back the land. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And that's... What's that impacting the reefs? Well, um, so I think Impacting the reefs would be so any outflow. Um, funny story is so any outflow, like sewage outflow. Um, I remember Dr. Philip telling me, hey, you see, look up on the hill there. Um, that looks like outflow, sewage outflow. Um, mm. Not snorkel here. <laughs> and of course, I forgot because I saw a, a chain moray eel and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And I went and snorkeled there. And for three days, my left eye couldn't open Whoa. because it was, you know, it's sewage coming down. Um, mm. and, uh, uh, thank goodness for holistic healing in the islands. So boiling, I don't know, DPPE, that plant. And uh, right. so, yeah. And I stayed, um, I always stay at Monty's in Toku, so that's uh, Mr. Montano Sr. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, Marshall's dad, and this guy, his background is in geology, and uh, he knows a lot of holistic uh, healing, and it's close connection. Um, when I was doing my master's, I walked to the reefs mm. uh, from there, um, and it's, it's a wealth of knowledge from him, also a wealth of knowledge from local personnel, lifeguards, um, in connection with the lifeguards, um, even fishermen, you know, knowing when they pull up fish, well, how has that changed? Uh, the reefs have changed in terms of species richness, and the amount of fish collected has changed. Um, you know, it's it's challenging to make a living, mm. um, especially in the, you know, we're going to experience climate change. We're going to experience this from now till, because 20 years ago when they were talking about it, no one mm -hmm. listened as much. Yeah. So that effects. So um, that's my next question. Yeah. You had... um. You mentioned you, you started going to the reefs during your graduate work. So mm -hmm. that's a few years now that you've been doing the surveys, I would mm -hmm. say. And um, when you, you've you noticed that difference or decline in diversity there over time, do you I think... Would, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, do you... Um, well, you could share some more about, about that because I, I noticed on your graphs you had... Um, you had populations by species, and then yeah. overall, I don't know, um, you know, how much of an impact has occurred there. Okay. Do you think we've done irreversible damage? So I, when I first started doing research here, um, 
one of the lifeguards that did scuba diving, um, they would go out on the boat and scuba dive at the reef's crest. So I don't do much research at the reef crest, but you know the reefs have been dying 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So and you know that's where you see most of your biodiversity. Um, I get the remnants looking at the reef flat, but still you see you see a lot of di diversity, biodiversity there. Um, the thing is, how much has it declined over the years? But then again, how much has certain species adapted? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one of the reasons I do genetics with the zoanthariums is because them things are sturdy. They, <laughs> they will adapt and they may change the way reefs look in 10, 20 years. Going mm -hmm. from more hard coral, pristine, to more soft coral, algae in the middle, battling for space, which means less fish diversity because, you know, big fish eat small fish, small fish live on the reefs. Um, mm -hmm. Reefs are prime nursery areas. Um, mangroves, prime nursery areas for many things. Um, going from, well, folks don't eat sea urchins in Trinidad yet. Although I did um, hear someone said, hey, they made a good curry out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is in Trinidad, which surprised me a lot. But oh, we depend on fish a lot. Um, have you seen the cost of fish during Lent? Hmm. I mean, it, we depend on fish a lot. Um, and so fishermen have to go out a little more. They have to try different places. Um, it, it's just a steady decline in things. Um, the human population on the planet, we're not getting smaller. Um, we're getting more and we need food, more, more food. Um, as you know, Trinidad is, has you know, oil and petroleum. Those are two huge things. Um, if you ask someone, well, what do you think about oil in Trinidad, the most response they would say is, well, you know, it gives us, you know, the ability to be prosper prosperous right. versus the other Caribbean islands. Um, we have, you know, we have taken advantage of this a lot. You would hardly, someone will hardly say other than us environmentalists, someone will hardly say, well, I don't like oil the rigs in Trinidad. No, because we, a lot of people see it as um, a prosperous part of, you know, that. So, yeah, and it may be something we may need to ask again. You know, what are your feelings about the environment mm -hmm. and the possibility of a massive oil spill and what that may do? Yeah, and that's that's mm -hmm. like a serious risk factor there. Mm -hmm. I have two more questions, one for you and then one for your students, okay. if they would um, humor me. So um, I read a little bit about um, artificial reefs that okay. some scientists have been trying to institute. What's, what's your thought on that? Is there yeah. any role for that in Trinidad in some of these regions? Are they successful? Ooh. Yeah, so I've seen artificial reefs in the Red Sea. Um, mm -hmm. It's very expensive, believe it or not, um, to bring a crane and drop those concrete things. Um, they have a set personnel and team that monitors what they see. Um, and it's, they have an aquarium to the public, at least in, in Jordan. Um, I was fortunate to be there for, you know, six weeks and it connects to the ocean and, you know, families come and visit and okay we don't have anything like that and to be honest um if we're thinking being honest um we don't really do an excellent job at maintaining things right um, you all shaking your head so you all know exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about um but until we change that mentality um, honestly, if 
one, I know we have water parks for kids and adults, and that's a big thing now, water parks. But wouldn't it be cool to have a nice aquarium close? Mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I've seen it in hey, what, a main attraction here, Georgia Aquarium. Um, the Georgia. Chattanooga Aquarium. I mean, and that's because, you know, it's more landlocked, but we're an island. So I that's mean, an interesting I, idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, we... that re that requires maintenance too. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but that, it yeah. it is a a nice attraction. Yes, that could generate you know some revenue that can go back into preserving areas like this. So. Yes, mm -hmm. that revenue may not be not... Quick at the beginning. Mm -hmm. It may come over time. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have yeah. people that we can do that? Yes. There are many scientists at the University of the West Indies. Mm -hmm. We have top scientists in the world in Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Judy Gobin, Dr. Diva Elmore. Those are the top two. There are more. Wonderful. So we have the human resources. We have the capacity. <laughs> yes. Yes. We definitely do. Well, it was kind of along those lines of awareness that I wanted to throw out a question to some of your students to see what their thoughts might be. Um, going back to the article where you were trying to advocate for the reefs based on the information and the data that you had collected and presenting that to the government, um, I saw that um, one of the responses in some of the articles, yeah. well, it's not it's not going to affect the reefs that much. It's not going to um, the hell is that? have that much of an impact. And I was just wondering, you know, I think that sometimes we have to, so we have the scientists who are sending the data and the, the, the numbers and the stats to the decision makers. And sometimes I think it's important for us to create more of an awareness with the average citizen as well. Um, and to get them to support that and to lobby. So I was wondering what the students might think about the best way to reach themselves, their peers who may not be in science, um, community members, family members. What, what What's the best strategy, do you think, to try to raise awareness on issues like this or to get the data out there? Um, what would you suggest? Do I need to add points for comments? <laughs> so the students um, have the option of putting their answer in the chat, or you could unmute yourself and ask, you know, answer the question. Don't let me call names. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> they mean to put them on the spot. I was just interested. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe there should be like maybe more social media platforms. Maybe we could put it more out there on like more Facebook and X. Okay. Like a social media campaign. Yes, ma'am. I like that. Mm -hmm. I heard you say Facebook. Um, some of my, my students tell me that they aren't on Facebook. Is that true? The younger generation? <laughs> it depends. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's another comment that talks about social media in the chat. A uh -huh. big outreach. Okay. So, I've been so, seeing... building on, so building on that, um, it seems to me that w in addition to, you know, the social media, there, there needs to be like, active groups and organizations that are constantly, you know, um, talking about this issue, presenting it to um, the government ministries, um, because if they, and, and also people that, particularly people that live in the area as well, because um, I'm pretty concerned about the impact that that port would have. I mean, are we um, all um, aware of 
any sort of environmental impact studies? Have they been done? Have they been released to the public? Have there been public comment? Um, uh, first time I'm hearing about it. Do you have a sense that? Well, I mean, I can I can see from. And once again, this was just before uh, the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing was that they hired a company from California mm -hmm. uh, to do a one month, um, I guess, survey slash investigation. Um, when you know you had published data on what's out there, mm -hmm. um, it went from things like putting nets in the ocean during construction to catch debris to artificial reefs. I mean, to replace the reefs, that would be, I think the biggest thing for me, why I got on to it is because they said the reefs wouldn't be, um, nothing will happen to them. Okay, so don't lie and say <laughs> the same map you have available to the public that's literally on the the site itself um don't say it's not it will be 100 percent uh destroyed yeah so i was fortunate so um that media personnel reached out to me and you know if you go back on my website here you will see um, all the media clippings of mm -hmm. back and forth um you know and it you, so the infrastructure is continuing so if you're heading to toku you will notice that the roads are now um accessible than before hmm. that leads to you must have the in, you must build up the infrastructure before you actually put it start you know that up there now I've spoken to a few local persons there. Uh, the young people want it because jobs. Um, the older people, they're not concerned too much about it. Um, so I think my, I guess my mission is to provide the information. And so that's what I've been doing. Um, I've been pushing a lot on this genetic work here because because it's so important. And now that I'm finding new things using it, um, usually one of the important things to do when you're doing this kind of thing is to make it known to all. So, and, so, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so has uh, UE, you know, department, uh, marine organizations, environmental organizations in Trinidad, have they all tried to, you know, um, bring awareness to this issue? So, so during the uh, responses um, to the document that was made available, um, there are, so I know who they are. Um, I know, and that was the cool part about it, is that now I know um the folks there, they know who I am and I know who they are. And when this thing comes up again, we all come together and read the report and give our uh, feedback on the report. So whereas there was only, I think if if Dr. Philip was Dr. Dawn Philip was still alive, um, because she brought UE students every other summer, well to Toku. Um, no one has really taken that yet. I know um, if I know if Dr. Jason was still there, um, and he's more fish, but I know he's in the U.S. Um, mm. doing work. But you know, the I don't think there's anyone. There are people, but it's kind of difficult to bring students to get students to come. Um, I can tell you this though, um, my good colleague uh, Dr. Conway from uh, Texas E and M. They bring he bring his he brings his students and stay in Toko, but they are focused more on fish. So mm -hmm. what I do and Dr. Philip had said this is wouldn't it be cool to have 
the Texas E&M group, the Martin Methodist, well now UT Southern group and UE group, all these students meet, meet together. And one section is doing fish, one corals, one, you know, and that spreads it as well. Um, because I, I bring posters as well, um, four by three foot posters of um, information about the reefs. Um, they, I have to bring some new ones back to the Toku um, lifeguard booth. But, you know, I have them in my high school, Arima, um, Holy Cross College, uh, Boys RC, all of the schools I attended, mm. you have these posters showing different um, organisms you find on the reef. So it's really passing on knowledge, you know, passing on that right. information. And yeah. and forming a coalition of yes. yeah. and groups yeah. um, that are constantly, you know, bringing awareness, knowledge, <laughs> and trying to influence the policy because I'm not totally against development, right? What you have to do is trying to find the balance yes. between development, economics, and the, the environment. Right. And I'm just wondering if that document and the decision makers have worked through all of those aspects, a holistic, mm -hmm. um, I could see the benefits to the region, um, you know, for putting a Toko port, but is that the best location? What would be done to, um, maybe this could be along your lines, like getting, making sure that we sample every organism there and have it archived somewhere, you so, know? I, I, so I know there were three potential sites they were looking at. Um, but those weren't feasible, and so this is how they end up with the site next to the um, Toko Fishing and Depot. Um, so I am doing that <laughs> genetically. Um, mm -hmm. You know, taking because small these down. things are going to be destroyed, and so yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. having having a living archive of them somewhere, mm -hmm. their cells and all of that type of stuff is important that'd be great for an aquarium wouldn't it uh-huh yeah well yeah. or is this a, um an opportunity to generate conversation around mm -hmm. like a green port or a sustainable port or, or how can we do this to still preserve the environment sometimes i i wonder if we can't challenge ourselves to meet the infrastructural need for a port, but at the same time, find a way to be creative mm -hmm. um, that can preserve or or find a way to give back to the environment there um, to compensate for it. But I guess that's um, that, that, that would be part of the challenge of the conversations to talk about the willingness and the openness to recognize the importance of the data that has been presented as opposed to dismissing it. I agree. Um, yeah. So uh, we could probably take a couple more questions. Um, we want to get off here maybe in the next um, five minutes or so. Yeah. Any other students have comments or questions or anybody else? I saw um, Katrina. Um, she does a lot of work as well. Um, I think she's been on uh, Environmental Fridays as well. Oh, yeah, um, she's one of yeah. my admin assistants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, we have people, you know, it's, but, you know, we continue. How about this? We continue with the mission to spread awareness and knowledge. Um, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's frustrating, um, very frustrating because the persons that are at um, government you know, positions, they don't see mm -hmm. um, the importance or maybe they don't put enough emphasis or energy into it mm -hmm. um, because they have their agendas. And, you know, I understand that okay. because you have to, you know, follow that. But, um, you know, I'm always willing to share information and that's why I try and um, 
you know, publish scientific. Um, I see a question, a hand up there. I think that's, is Sheldon. that Katrina? I see Sheldon's hand up. Sheldon? Go ahead, Sheldon. Yeah, sorry, I was trying I was trying to take this thing off of uh, mute. Um, so I had a question, but um, I don't know if it's answered already because I'm at I'm at uh, work and I'm sneaking listening, I'm, I'm in and out. <laughs> <laughs> but the one of the questions I have is um so I'm originally from Tobago mm -hmm. and um the I noticed the reef, um uh, since you're talking about corals and stuff, the reef. Uh, when I was growing up there, it looks completely different than uh, now. You know? And uh, I was wondering if you did any work. So I heard you're talking about Toko and stuff, mm -hmm. but did you do any work with the reef in Boku in terms of uh, what's going on in terms of how it looks, if it's regenerating or is it... Uh, I'm, I'm thinking this pollution, but I just know, did you look into that in your research or anything like that? Uh, so, so no, but guess what? There, there are, Tobago has a really good group mm -hmm. uh, doing stuff there. And so I know them, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, like I said, Dr. Um, Niva Moon, you have, I mean, mm -hmm. you have a lot of them yeah. doing work there. Um, Dr. There's a research group up in Charlottesville. Yes, yes. Uh, there is uh, Eric. Yes, uh -huh. yeah, Eric. Yeah. Uh, there is the Buku Reef Trust. Mm -hmm. Um, they've been on here before. Both yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So that um, Sheldon, that actually would be a good. The answer to your question there, um, I think, maybe reach out and they. I think they have websites. Maybe you can reach out to um, them. Uh, the reason why I'm doing Toku is because there wasn't any uh, information on these reefs. Mm -hmm. And there is more on Boko Reef because Boko Reef is uh, protected. Yeah. Um, and Toku Reefs, the, these are not protected. A lot of land issues. Um, and that's why I chose this. Are you thinking about other on the north, um, east coast, northwest coast? Are you thinking of other sites as well, um, or do you know of others that are working? San Susi. I don't know um, if there are as many reefs in San Susi or um, Matlot and stuff like that. But are there people that's going to be working in those areas too? Who as of now, no. Okay. But, um, so I know uh, Ronald Joseph, he does um, a lot of environmental stuff. He's also a lifeguard. Mm. And I remember one time he sent me a photo, believe it or not, from Blanche Shares or Matla. I can't <laughs> remember which one. Okay. But it may have been Matla, but there's Zoantherians there. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh my gosh, I've got to go there yeah. uh, to confirm this. But um, so maybe on my next trip, I need to, you know, take yeah. a drive uh, there as well. So we, yeah. my dad and our family, um, he was a pastor mm -hmm. and that was one of the districts. So I know that area fairly well, grew yeah. up in that area, Toko, Kumana, Balandra, Matt, all the way through to Matt lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Which I think, they, of course, they mostly focus on the leatherback turtles. Which, right, right. Which I is mean, fine. <laughs> that's that's yeah. fine. Because we, I mean, I think the general public is, feels good about leatherback turtles. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, so that's, that's really one positive feature. Oh, you, yeah. First, you can't sit on sit on a leatherback turtle and post it on social media mm -hmm. because uh, the wailing and gnashing of teeth from you know from everyone else you know mm -hmm. really um so so that's a good thing a good public awareness yeah, of that yeah so maybe we could tie 
the preservation, conservation of the reefs to the leatherback turtles in some way. Yes, I've thought about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. All right, very good. Um, thank um, you, Professor uh, Belford. Thank you so much again to my dear friend. My pleasure. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. I think we had fun. I think we I learned a lot. Um, yeah appreciative that you also had your students. I think we were up to like 44 persons online. Okay, good, good. And I, I, I wanna hail out Dr. Brown, Dr. Gloria Brown. Um, she yes. used to be my former chemistry lecturer at what was CUC. It's just right. the same time. Right, um, she's a regular <laughs> supporter of uh, Environmental Fridays, yes. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, Bellamy, it's my pleasure to see you. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> and I'm so proud of you. I wish I knew more that's happening in your, that you're doing. But well, I, got on a keep in touch. <laughs> yeah, I got on a little late, so I didn't hear the, you know, the beginning parts. But when I saw that you were here, I thought, oh, I have to say, some, say hi to her. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. I'm and sorry. also, uh, Professor Belford, you had mentioned Dr. Carol Draper, yes. and I remember her, she used to work for us um, part-time some years back teaching ecology, yes. doing ecology yes. labs with yeah. the students as well, mm -hmm. so it was nice yeah. to hear that name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And speaking of chemistry, uh, I'm assuming there hasn't been too much like studies, chemical studies of the reef, both of the, you know, the water as well as I th organisms. So I think maybe um, IMA may have information. Okay. So that may be a Dr. Anjani question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ganesh, Dr. Ganesh. Yeah. I think I think there is. Um, if you if you know of, you could send me a, a contact or something yeah. offline. Yeah, that would be a good topic for Environmental okay. Fridays too. Okay, okay. Um, maybe Hannah Lochan as well. Um, I'll, I'll do that. All right, very good. Yeah. So again, thanks a lot, everyone. And we'll see you back here next week, hopefully. Um, next week's uh, presentation would be coming from Castara, Tobago, which is promoted as one of the most environmentally friendly communities in our country. So... Uh, we want to come and take a look at what they're doing as a model community. Thanks again. Have a All great right. day. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Okay.